So this is a very short version I'm giving now. This is in 1951. And um, His Holiness and the, the Kashag, right, basically sent uh, uh, Napa, Jigwing, Napa Gawang Jigwing, uh as a delegate to lead the negotiations. Um, under duress, right? Uh, while in Beijing, he and the delegation were forced to sign using stamps that had been basically forged, right, by the Chinese government. Uh, the Dalai Lama ended up kind of um, saying, no, this wasn't a legal thing. You weren't supposed to do this. But basically, the it's called the 17 point agreement ended up going into operation with the Tibetan government hoping that the Chinese would kind of do the right thing, that they would honor uh, certain proclamations that were in there, such as that, you know, his holiness will retain his powers, Tibet will be governed by Tibetans, the Chinese will be respectful. And again, I'm kind of paraphrasing here, but there was enough leeway in there that the Tibetan government thought perhaps we can make this work. Unfortunately, that was a geopolitically naive, right, sort of thing. Also at the time, again, we're back, we're in the Cold War. This was a time in the world where no country was really going to come to Tibet's aid um, and to pick a fight with China, which then would have drawn the Soviet Union in. So it was a really bad time. Also, um, you know, the Korean War was happening. So basically, uh, the Tibetan government tried to cooperate with the Chinese. The Chinese did not uphold their promises. They continued to take over Tibet, to displace uh, any Tibetan um, actual, right, sincere involvement in governance, as well as continuing to oppress, um, you know, different villages and monasteries, especially, you know, religion. And eventually the Tibetan people, first in the form of, you know, different just citizens armies in Eastern Tibet, that then grew connected, that then grew into the official Chushigandru army, right, that then fought back. Uh, in March of 1959, eventually the Dalai Lama had to flee, right, on foot into India. Um, thousands of Tibetans followed. And so it's then in the spring of 1959 that we get um, basically the full takeover of Tibet by China, you know, such that Tibet becomes a colony of China incorporated into the People's Republic of China with the departure of the Dalai Lama and the establishment of the, you know, refugee and exile community in India. Um, you know, and I think the Tibetans thought, you know, His Holiness and everyone thought they would be in India for a couple months or maybe a year maximum, right? And it's now been 61 years, so multiple generations. So that's probably as short as I can make it. <laughs> uh, within the Tibetan community, um, we have uh, a sort of a confusion, I think, more, more, it's more like a confusion, um, you know, uh, regarding the official name of the Tibetan resistance, right? There is mm -hmm. the uh, uh, Chushi Gangtu, and then a lot of people will say that no, no, it's actually called Tensun Thanglang Mangmi. Chushi Gangtu is a synonym for come, and as long as people were fighting in Eastern Tibet, it was. But then in 1958 onwards, it was uh, converted to Tensun uh, Tanglang Mangmi. How uh, is that true? Uh, and uh, can you please uh, expand on that? Thank you. Okay. As I understand it, which is as the veterans taught me, um, it's actually in the reverse. <laughs> so initially, in calm, um, when the different, uh, you know, people and men and women initially, right, in the different Payu of Kham started fighting against the Chinese, they did so under uh, the name Tenseng Danglangmar. Some places they say Tensi Danglangmar, so actually two different names, although Tenseng is the, is the most common one. Um, I was first told this um, about uh, individuals in Litang that they got together, the people from all the different like Trongse, right, in Litang and came together and wrote letters to the leaders, whether they were Perns or Rinpoches, whoever were the leaders of different Payu, and sent it out under the name of Tenseng Tanglangmar, saying we are joining together, right, as defenders of the faith. Um, so for a long time, that was at least for two years, right, as I understand it, that is the name under which the fighters, right, took to the battlefield. In Hasa, when they decided that they were going to form an organized army uh, dedicated to His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, they actually turned to Trijang Rinpoche and asked him to give the army a formal name, 
right? And of course, right, because of his link to the Dalai Lama, he also was, right, Kampa. Uh, and so he suggested the name Chushigandru. So when the army was inaugurated, right, on June 16, 1958 in Hwasa, um, then that became the formal name of the army. However, Tenzin Dalai or Tensi Dalai Lama, these names still very much, it's not as if that name goes away, right? It's still the same, right? Still fighting for the same and still in many ways, the same group of people. But so the Chushigandru name comes in 1958. And Chushigandru, of course, uh, for people who aren't familiar with it, is an ancient name for Kam, right? Meaning four rivers and six ranges. So it describes the region, you know, through a geographical name. Uh, great. Uh, Carol, could you, uh, would you mind reading the, the Chushigandru declaration uh, at this point? Um, so the army, one of the things that they did was actually they wrote a lot um, and they wrote different things like proclamations, letters, they drew illustrated pamphlets about uh, the war and about communism and about Buddhism to try and educate people. So the proclamation I'm about to read is something that was written by the soldiers. It was published in a Tibetan language newspaper published in Kalimpong. Uh, in English, it was called Tibet Mirror. The Tibetan name is uh, Yulchok Sosu Saju Melon. And the original is available in Tibetan. If you want to look for it, I'm going to read you a translation in English. And this was translated um, by myself with a lead translator, um, my good friend and colleague, uh, Tenzin Pulso Bagansang. Proclamation of the Tibetan Volunteer Army for Defense of Religion. The universe was started in this way, on a foundation made of webs of wind, a golden land was formed. Ropa Lake was, on the golden land, Ropa Lake was formed. In the center of the lake, Mount Meru arose. Four supreme worlds emerged on the four sides of Mount Meru. The earth was on the southern side. Tibet, the land surrounded by a fence of snowy mountains, the upper side of which contains Ngari Korsun, in the center, Utsang Rushi, and in the lower part, Dokam Gantu. The soul of Tibet is His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, whose life is as strong as a diamond, the rays of which light all of the four directions. Andrew Gompotashi, has sown the white rice of merit. The paddy has grown well, and a good harvest for happiness in Tibet was reaped. As the six ranges mark the land, the enemy of Buddhism, the communists, have been demolished like the sun melting frozen dew on rocks. As the four rivers run through the valleys, the sand dunes of communism have been washed away. The flag of prosperity for Buddhism has been raised atop the six ranges. The banner of long life spans the four rivers. The world's white marble stupa remains without delusion in the three realms of existence and lives long without negative effect to body, mind, or speech. Born from the mind of the Dharma King, the fame of the leader of Chushigandru is louder than thunder. For the sake of all sentient beings and for Buddhism, we have pledged to reduce the enemies of Buddhism to mere specks of dust. A new era of the dual system of religion and politics has come. Rejoice, rejoice. From the Eastern border of our beloved country of Tibet, the flames of fire burning point to the East. From the east, the Chinese troops fired down bombs like rain. Oh, isn't it a miracle? The rain of bombs has not put out the fire. Instead, the fire burns even stronger. It is burning all over Tibet. It burns with a roaring sound, and the words from the burning fire say, let Tibet be independent. Let us protect the Dharma. It is a miracle. The fire gets stronger. The glory of the burning fire spreads around the world. There is a reason why the fire gets stronger. The wind of support for justice 
blows from all corners of the world. Now is the time for those with faith in Dharma to stoke the fire. This fire is the very foundation of the Dharma's own fire. It cannot be put out with the rain of bombs. It cannot be blown out by the winds of deceit. Now stand up, people of Kham and Utsang. Tibetans who share the same flesh and blood, now is the time to stand up. Stand up for the independence of Tibet and Tibetan Buddhism. And this is signed from the Information Office of the Volunteer Army for Politics and Religion, 10th day of the second month, Earth Pig Year, 1959. Uh, looking at the Tibetan issue from an outsider's point of view, you know, Shimla, Shimla agreement, I think that's where everything got messed up, like, you know, for, for India, for China, for Tibet, for everybody, that's where, you know, everybody messed up. Like, that's when, that's also, as far as I know, that's also when the British first coined the idea of an inner Tibet and outer Tibet. Like, I don't know what's wrong with these colonial mentality. They just want to separate states, like, you know, wherever they go, they just like, boom, boom, like, you know, so, and then I think that actually idea got into the communist, you know, when they started talking, like, talking about the autonomous Tibet and, you know, say, uh, uh, like the, mm -hmm. the Tibet prefecture. Um, yes. So, like, do you think there is any ground to that, like the British being the per perpetrator of all this trouble? I like to blame a lot of things on the British. So yes, absolutely. Um, uh, you know, Tibet has been either colonized or in an imperial zone of three different powers, um, at least for contemporary, for modern history, uh, Chinese, you know, British and American. So Tibet might not have been colonized by Britain, right? In the way that India was, but it was very much within the British imperial sphere. And the British did everything possible to keep Tibet politically neutral, um, to kind of hold off China. And what does it mean to keep uh, a country politically neutral? It means to make sure it's powerless. So you are absolutely correct. Um, and I've actually written about this. I have an entire article on Simla, on the Simla Convention and on the borders of Eastern Tibet. And you're correct. So um, the British are the ones who introduce ideas of inner Tibet and outer Tibet that later get translated into the terms political Tibet and ethnographic Tibet. These are colonialist terms um, that some scholars still use today. Um, I, I actually write a lot about this in Arrested Histories. Um, and actually draw on a model put forward, not by British uh, colonial officials, but the model I prefer is the one um, put forth by Tashi Sering, right? Who um, for many years was the research office at the Library of Tibetan Works and Archives and is now the head of Amni Machin Institute, right? And has been for a long time. Um, we also write about it. I also wanted to hold up this book, uh, Resistance and Unity, which is a book written by the Jangritsang family about their father's service as a um, Machi, as a general, right, in Shushigandru. But they also talk about that, right? And this is a family based in Chamdo, which is on the west side of Drichu, but asking the question of what is calm, right? And what, what are the boundaries of Tibet? The boundaries are, of Tibet um, are not they are both right now, right, geopolitically. Um, Tibet currently is part of the People's Republic of China. Uh, like that is geopolitic real geopolitical reality today. That does not mean it was reality yesterday and it certainly does not mean it is going to be reality tomorrow, right? And so the future of Tibet, including what Tibet's cultural, political, religious boundaries are is something that should be determined by the Tibetan people. Right, and not put forward by either British, you know, imperial officials in 1913 or Chinese colonial officials, you know, in 1962, um, and certainly not by anyone else. So, um, one thing we do know about empires, right, is that empires don't last forever. Some do have seem to have longer duration than others, um, but there is none that uh, appears to have lasted forever, right? The British were in India for a very long time and are no longer there. 
So, you know, what the future holds for Tibet um, remains to be seen, but it is not only ever going to be a future in and of China. So just like Chishigandu is a arrested history in the context of Tibetan history, Tibetan history is arrested history in the context of, context of the world politics. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tibetan history right now, right, is, is being held hostage. You know, China is a world superpower. And as we've seen, you know, there's no country, mm -hmm. um, you know, including, you know, you and I are both in the United States right now, so, you know, having a conversation from two different US cities. The United States does not stand up to China in a way that fully benefits Tibet. No country does. But again, right now is will not always be like this. Um, so there has to be, I feel, a hope for the future. So these three questions, like what is the danger of Tibetan story being told from an outsider's point? Is there anything that we as Tibetans or to the CIA and then what do we say to those people who claim that, you know, his holiness is under CIA payroll? Okay. I'll, I'll try and take those in, in the order you ask them. Um, well, first, if the story of the Tibetan resistance is told as an American story um, or a CIA story, right, it, it, then therefore it's ignoring um, Tibetan experiences, Tibetan commitments, and the fact that the Tibetan resistance army is a creation of the Tibetan people, All right? So, and here's where it helps, I think, to think about what is the perception of the CIA in the world, All right? So the CIA is the Central Intelligence Agency, right? There's a US government uh, spy operation, right? So this is our spy agency. And certainly some Americans and as well as uh, many people around the world do not have a positive view of the CIA. And here is why. The CIA is known for uh, going into countries and to staging coups to overthrow democratically elected governments, right? In which case they go in, they find, you know, maybe disgruntled or dispossessed people, create an army or create a movement and then overthrow a legitimate government. When you do that, you know, you don't make friends, not just in the country where you've overthrown the government, but even among your own citizens, as well as people around the world. So the CIA has a well-earned negative reputation, right, as um, not just controversial, but also as unethical, right, as an unethical body acting in the world um, to make the world safe for U.S. political and business interests, Right? So the interests of the CIA in general are those of America and not of the country in which they're intervening. The case of Tibet really stands apart. It is a different story. Um, and so actually, in addition to all of the Tibetan veterans with whom I did um, you know, conversations and interviews and research, I also did research and conversation with retired CIA officers and agents who worked on the Tibet program. And what they told me was that the Tibet operation was different from any other operation they worked on, you know, in the rest of their time with the CIA, because the Tibetans had their own cause. They existed as a movement, as a resistance force, well before the CIA ever got involved. And so they had a relationship of mutual respect between them. And so if you tell the story just from the American perspective, you miss out that very important Tibetan side of the story, um, which is important, I think, for Tibetan history, but uh, also helps us to maybe take a new look at the CIA that not everyone wants to take, right? Some people only want to consider the CIA from a political or a historic stance. They don't want to consider that the CIA is also composed of actual people you know, some of whom entered into real relationships of friendship and even love, right, with the Tibetan soldiers with whom they served. You know, that challenges things, that, that changes, you know, the critiques you want to make of the CIA. It, it qualifies things in a way that can be awkward for ideological politics. Okay, so I'm kind of jumping from question one to question three. I'm going to come back to three and, and posit number two now. So what do Tibetans have to be thankful for to the CIA? Well, 
the U.S. government did offer some help to, you know, to Chushigandru and to the Tibetan exile government um, in a time of real dire straits. And there was some true humanitarian initiative in there. There was also a lot of anti-communist, you know, um, reasoning and logic behind that. And here's where I want to draw a distinction between the highest levels of government. So say the people, you know, in Washington DC, in the White House or, you know, the Pentagon who are making decisions or Langley where the CIA office building versus the men on the ground, right? Who actually lived in the secret training camp right here in Colorado with the Tibetan soldiers, right? That's two different levels of interaction. Um, I really don't want to say Tibetans have to be thankful to the CIA or to the American government at all. Um, I don't think that anyone should say thank you for, for help in that way. I think that this country, right, my country provided some help but did not provide help that was sufficient. And I wish that we had, I wish other countries had joined in to say, this is not right. And even though it's a politically inconvenient moment right now to be challenging China, we need to do that anyways, because it's the right thing to do. But that's not how international politics works. Um, so I think it's important for Tibetans to know the history and to know what happened and to know, well, here's why the US government aided Tibet and continues to do so, right? Does continue to provide financial support to the refugee, you know, to the exile community. Um, and here's why it wasn't enough. And here are the demands we can now make, including those now thousands of Tibetans who now live in the United States as citizens and can now not just run for public office, but can go to the, you know, offices of their elected representatives and say, I'd like to have a conversation about this as your constituent, right? So I think it's less about thank you and more about continuing the work together. All right, but let's come back to that last part because <laughs> this is something that comes up again and again. And it's um, mostly inter folks around the world who consider themselves to be communist or Marxist politically, right? And who are far leftist. Um, and who are trying to often um, imagine a more just society, right? A more equal society. Unfortunately, um, the adherence to that sometimes goes with a um, you know, misrepresentation of actual history, right? And instead you get a celebration of China as now the world's remaining communist you know, state with any power, you know, real power in the world. And so you turn a blind eye to anything negative about China and you accept all propaganda from the Chinese government as truth. So we, a video just went up on Twitter this past week, you know, basically saying that, you know, China has always ruled Tibet and China liberated Tibet and see the CIA helped the Dalai Lama and helped Tibet. So Tibet is now corrupt by virtue of its association with the CIA, right? And those arguments are ideological but they're not historically correct. And so I think what happens, how do you fight ideology? Um, I think you fight it with history, right? And you adhere to, you know, historical fact. I have oh, really? <laughs> one last question for you. Um, so again, going back to your book, uh, you know, as much as I loved, like absolutely enjoyed reading the book, there were times, you know, I found it, just a little bit difficult to write. I, and I think, you know, that's because of your ethnographic uh, anthropolog anthropological background, like, you know, shining. Um, I found out that you are working on a Pangdatsang book on Pangdatsang. Uh, a, I wish it is not going to be as anthropological and ethnographic as Arrested Histories, and also B, uh, who is Pangdatsang briefly? Yeah, okay. Um, first, let me say, yes, academics, sometimes we, we tend to write sometimes in very specialized language uh, that can be difficult to read if you're not used to reading it. So I also, um, and especially as my career has gone on, have tried more and more to write in a way that's available to more people to read. Um, and to make my readings accessible, they're all on my website, as well as to give talks 
right? And when you talk, at least I don't, I tend, I, I think, <laughs> I, I talk more like a regular person and not like a professor, at least I try to. Uh, Pundasang family, very quickly, um, are a fascinating family who in the span of one generation went from being an important um, regional trading family in Kham to the wealthiest family in all of Tibet and one of the most powerful. And so, and so this is from 1900 to 1950s, basically. And so my story is about the rise and fall of the family. Um, and the, their fall didn't just come, however, in 1950s with the advent of Tibet becoming part of, a ch of China. Um, it happened in exile through a conflict with Jalutundu, right, with um, His Holiness, the Dalai Lama's elder brother. And so this family also gets not, uh, not so much erased from history as, um, eliminated from Tibetan society. I call it a social death, right? They're kind of, um, the words eluding me now, but they're basically removed from society. Uh, and so telling the story of how does this family go from being favorites of the Dalai Lama, you know, the wealthiest, most successful family to all of a sudden falling really, really, um, you know, low and living without their name for a long time. Um, so I am writing that book. I've written several articles about the family, but the book is is forthcoming. And I thank you for the encouragement to write it in uh, for regular folks uh, like us. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> no, but then again, I mean, you know, I did learn a lot about like, I mean, you know, I, like reading academy books. So being a storyteller, being sort of involved in the filmmaking, you know, like we don't like these like, big academic words you know we just want to be able to like express our emotions like how do i do that you know uh, but then no again you know yeah. i will say arrested histories um tibet the cia and uh uh forgot uh, memories of a forgotten war amazing amazing story thank you so much and congratulations on the success of this book. Uh, you know, to my viewers, I will absolutely recommend reading this book, uh, not just for the history uh, of Tibet, you know, but to enjoy the read as well, and uh, as well as meet this, these historical people. I am so sad that we're not able to talk about Lofsan Tinle really, like, you know, but then I really hope that we will be able to uh, meet again on the Kendra Palden show and you know continue on our conversation yeah very good thank you so much for having me and to everyone who's tuned in um it's really my honor and my pleasure i feel very lucky um to be trusted with these stories and to try and and do them justice by sharing them with the world thank you Karen.